Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our distinguished lecture series. It's a pleasure to welcome you this week. My name is Jeff McDonald, and I'm the Associate Director of the Global Institute for Water Security and host of this uh, session. Uh, before I introduce our, our speaker, uh, Renee Brooks, for this week, I want to remind you that uh, Teresa Bloom is our speaker next week, coming to us from Germany. I also want to uh, acknowledge that we're coming to you from Treaty 6 territory, homeland of the Métis, and uh, we at the Global Institute for Water Security want to recognize and respect these uh, First Nations and their ancestors and strive to work with them on our various projects to make water more sustainability in our part of Canada. This series is underwritten by the Global Institute for Water Security and is part of the Global Water Futures Program. And I want to welcome our online participants as part of that program. I also want to welcome our Masters of Water Security students who take this for uh, seminar credit in their programs, both at University of Saskatchewan in Saskatoon and our Beijing Normal uh, program. So welcome. Well, it's my great pleasure to welcome a friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Renee Brooks. Uh, Renee is a, a research plant physiologist, a research plant physiologist from the U.S. Department of uh, Environmental Protection, based out of Corvallis, Oregon. She's been there since 2000. Prior to that, she was an assistant professor at the University of South Florida. Renee, Renee is an internationally known thought leader in stable isotope ecology, uh, eco-hydrology, and has pioneered a number of innovative uh, applications of isotope techniques at that interface between hydrology and ecology. And she's known, I think, for very high quality work. If I look at her hundred or so papers, fully seven have been awarded uh, uh, the star award from US EPA. This is recognition for exceptional uh, quality of scientific manuscripts. She has fully seven of these in that category. And I think that's indicative of the, the quality of, of the work that she's produced. She has a 2013 editor's citation for excellence in refereeing from uh, water resources research. And among her many uh, awards and commendations, uh, a bronze medal for commendable service from the Cinnamon Freshwater Habitat team. Um, Renee has also been very supportive to our, our field through uh, various activities on boards and, and, uh, and committees. And I, I wanna note her very uh, uh, hard work as editorial board of the, the journal Tree Physiology, associate editor for the journal Hydrological Processes, and being editorial board or associate editor for those two journals already says how respected she is both in ecology and hydrology. I don't know of any hydrologists that are also on the, the editorial board for a, a high quality plant journal like Tree Physiology. She's also on the board for Frontiers and Functional Plant Ecology. And uh, it's a real pleasure to welcome Renee today. And Renee, I'll, I'll turn it over to you and thanks so much for being with us. Ah, thank you, Jeff, for that introduction. Um, today, I wanted to talk to you about some basin level research. So I'm not really going to get into the tree physiology aspect. And instead, we're going to talk on large river basins and trying to assess the climate impacts on the water resources and where the water is coming from within the basin and how climate change changes that around. And I'm going to focus particularly on the Pacific Northwest of the United States. So in the pictures that you see here, we have, uh, this is the coast of Oregon, uh, off the Pacific coast right here. And this is a picture in May 2017, where you can see an above normal snowpack. And then May 2015, where we had 8% of normal snowpack. So our snowpack is highly vulnerable to climate change and that provides most of the water resources for those people living in the Pacific Northwest of the United States. But it also includes uh, the Canadian Pacific Coast. 
Of course, all of this work isn't done by one person. I have a great suite of collaborators and people that I've been working with over the years. And in these particular papers that I'm going to be focusing on today, um, these are the main collaborators. So we have Hank Johnson from the USGS. Lily McGill, she's a graduate student. She's got a couple of papers that I'm going to be featuring in here. She's a graduate student at the University of Washington. Ashley Steele, who is her primary advisor, and was working with the US Forest Service. Catalina Segura, who's here at Oregon State University. And then Grace Windler, another PhD student just recently finished, who was a, an NSF GRIP student with me um, and did the work on the Snake River that we've seen, as well as a bunch of EPA collaborators, just to list a few, Steve Klein, Bill Rue, who's been running the mass spectrometers in our lab for 20 some years and keeps threatening to retry her and I keep pleading with him not to, <laughs> and he's still here, so that's good news. Uh, Scott Leibowitz, who's done some fantastic work, Joe Ebersole, um, and Randy Camilio and Mark Weber. So those are some of the people that I just wanted to highlight that have contributed to this. So please keep them in mind. And I will come back particularly to Lily and Grace who were first author on a couple of papers I'm gonna feature. Um, so as I mentioned, the snowpacks in the Pacific Northwest of the United States um, are, are at threat to climate change and expected to decrease. And you can see that in that May 15th where we really had a low, or, yeah, the 2015, it had really low, low, low snowpack compared to what we normally have. Um, in the valley, most people, their water originates, we use the water that comes from, say the Willamette, which is the one, uh, here, let's see if you can see my mouse, hopefully. So this is the Willamette Valley here in, um, in Oregon. And most of the people in the state live within this valley and they rely on the snow that comes from these snowpacks. So the question is what's gonna happen when these snowpacks disappear or are low? And thinking more on hydrological questions, you know, um, we really wanted to know whether or not different basins throughout the Pacific Northwest function the same way when it comes to changes in the snowpack. Are they all similarly vulnerable to the same thing? Um, and then which parts of the watershed are most critical for sustaining low flow? And I'll get into the climate here, but know that we have a Mediterranean climate. So the summertime when the demand is highest for water, we also have the lowest amount of precipitation. So what approach do we use? First, I'm gonna present eight different basins of which we've created ice escapes across the Pacific Northwest. And we're trying to look at how the spatial variability of incoming precipitation, but in this case, we're actually not looking at precipitation, we're looking at surface waters of small watersheds to characterize that. Um, elevation, I'll just tell you to, to front, is the main driver of variation in water isotopes. And I'll go into water isotope theory and why that is in just a second. Um, but we do have some leeward basins that are a little bit anomalous. So I'm sort of giving you a little of the punchlines before we get into it. Uh, we focused on, and then after we developed these isoscapes, we look at major rivers. And there have been four that I've been able to get longer time series in to be able to feature in this. The Willamette River, which is the basin in which I live in, and so I've been able to sample for a much longer period of time, we've got 11 years worth of data. The Snake River, we have uh, six years. And the Snoqualmie River, which is up in Washington and is a major water supporter for the city of Seattle, um, we have one and a half years, that's Lily McGill's dissertation work. And then the Mary's River, I also live in the Mary's River watershed, which is a, a tributary to the Willamette. Um, we only have one year's worth of data that we've, we've worked up, but I'm thinking we're getting more of that. Um, that's Catalina Segura's work. Um, we combine those long-term isotope trends with flow data and try and get an estimation of that reliance of flow within the river and the snowpack. So just a little bit of background on why isotopes can help us to try and understand these questions 
about the contribution of snow. First off, isotopes uh, of water vary naturally across the landscape because of what we call the rain out effect. If you look at water vapor coming from a particular source, and for us in the Pacific Northwest, that would be the Pacific Ocean is the primary source of vapor. When that vapor moves in across the land and starts to drop water, the first water that drops are the heavier isotopes. They fall into the raindrops first and fall out. This is a process known as rain out. So as that vapor cloud continues across the landscape, the isotopic composition of the rain changes and becomes lighter and lighter and lighter. And as we have orographic lifting, that accelerates that rain out effect. And so by the time you get to the top of the mountains, you have very light isotopic signatures. And so now we have this natural variability in the, the precipitation inputs that can create something that we can look at and call isoscapes across the landscape. Here, for example, is the United States of America and the colors represent isotopic variability of precipitation with the redder warm colors being more depleted values and the blue colors, or sorry, the enriched values and the blue colors being the more depleted. So you can see here, this is the Pacific Northwest region up here that I'm focusing in on. And we've got a gradient as we move from the coast inland. So the eight watersheds that I'm featuring today and talking about are the Snake, which is in Boise, Idaho, it actually crosses about four different states across the US and is our largest one. Uh, the Willamette, which is the one I'll feature a little bit more because it's the one that's nearest and dearest to my heart. And then this is the Mary's River and we live right about here. That's where Corvallis and where I'm sitting right now. Um, this is the green. This is the Snoqualmie in blue. And I'm gonna come back. That's, that's one we're gonna feature a little bit more with the time series that, um, that Lily McGill has focused in on. Uh, the Wenatchee and the Skagit. And then we have a very small one in Alaska that I don't have on here. So as I mentioned before, the Pacific Northwest has a Mediterranean climate. We have very warm, dry summers and this summer was particularly warm as we had that heat dome effect that also affected Canada. Um, but we have cold, wet winters. So most of our precipitation falls between October and May. Um, and we have a strong orographic effect. So if you look at the precipitation here, this is the Cascade Mountains um, and where most of our snowpack is. This is the coast range over here. Doesn't have much of a snowpack, certainly not a permanent one. Um, but so most of the water comes from the Cascade Mountains for the Willamette Basin itself. And the river runs right through here. And we vary between one to four meters of precipitation on an annual basis. And we have a strong orographic effect because the storms come from the Pacific and move inland. And so we get this strong rain out across the Cascades. Here is an annual precipitation that I collect on a weekly basis here in Corvallis. And the main point I really wanted to show you here is that we don't have that seasonal, many locations have seasonal inputs of variation of the uh, isotopes of precipitation. But because we get so little in the summertime um, and we get uh, vapor that comes either from Alaska or from Hawaii, we get much more variation depending upon the storm track of where that's coming from, where that vapor originates um, than we do in a seasonal change in isotopes. So, there's no seasonal pattern in our weekly precipitation. Uh, and we also have very little variation between year to year in the annual average, which is represented by this gray line. So that sets us up for being able to then develop the isoscapes itself. So for example, I'll start with going into a little detail of how we did this for the Willamette. We selected six major tributaries the Middle Fork, which is located down here into the south part of the Willamette Valley, the Mackenzie, 
which is here, and the Kalapuya here, and the uh, Snoqualmie, the North Fork, oh, sorry, the Santiam River right here, and then the Lucky Amute and the Mary's River. And then this is the Willamette River right here. We sampled those um, at four times quarterly. So we could catch all the different hydrologic seasons within that. And then here's an example of what we did. In each of those drainages, we selected eight watersheds that represented a range of elevation so we could catch that rain out effect. And then we also sampled the tributaries themselves in different locations, as well as the Willamette at long various locations within there. So in each of those, we have small watersheds that we're thinking is gonna characterize what the incoming precipitation is in a spatial variability across that landscape. This is that data from the two different years that we collected. Um, and this was from a paper that I did in 2012. And you can see here, if we look at the mean watershed of the elevation for the two different isotopes of, and this is surface water isotope, not precipitation isotopes, you can see that there is a large change in, in the input uh, with the elevation. But for the most part, that's for those in the Cascades and not for those that come from the Coast Range, which is the Mary's River and the Aleckiamute River. Um, there's very little change with mean elevation in those, but the majority of our water does come from the Cascades. And you can see that there's this very, very strong relationship with decreasing isotope values as you go up in elevation. When you look over time, so these are the two years in which we characterize for the developing the isoscape. Um, and this is four of those different base, small tributary basins that going in, all the different little eight elevational variation with the colors representing elevations here. Um, you can see that we don't have a temporal variance uh, that's consistent across those. So they're, they're pretty much flat over time. Uh, but they have the elevational gradient. You can also see in the Lucky Amute, which is the one that is a leeward side basin, that lack of elevational gradient within those, that particular basin. So what we did is we took all of that data that we collected and we tried to explain which landscape variables explain most of the variability of the, of the surface water isotopes that we had. Elevation explained 85 to nearly 90% of the variation alone. We could have just stopped there, but we included a couple of more variables with precipitation, the longitude of location itself, whether or not it was in the coast range, so that recognizes that leeward versus non-leeward, um, and then the longitude of those coastal range sites as well bringing it up to nearly 95% of the variability, which is huge. So in the end, we, we pull that together. And if you look at small little Huck watersheds across the landscape, these are hydrologic units across the watershed and then apply that equations to them. This is the isoscape that we come up with for the Willamette. But the main part you can see, and you can see that strong elevational effect here of the Cascades um, explaining over 85% of the variation. So as we go forward, I'm pretty much gonna focus on that elevational variation rather than the other components that say were very minor parts of that. Okay, so that's the first isoscape. The second one we did was in the Snake Basin. And in this case, we drove through and sampled um, as many different locations as we could at three different drive-through trips. And these are the little watersheds that we sampled throughout the basin and they, the color represents the elevation with the darkest blue being the higher elevation points. Um, and the red outlines are the watersheds that they are representing. And for each of those watersheds, we looked at a large range of characteristics as we did in the uh, Willamette to try and come up with regressions. Um, this is the isotope data in dual isotope space with the oxygen isotope here. 
and the hydrogen isotope here. And this is the global meteoric water line in black. So anything that comes in as precipitation and doesn't have any evaporative effects, we would expect to fall near or on that line as most of them do when you're working down here in the more negative or depleted values. Um, whereas you can see some clear evaporation, so they fall below the line if they show in some evaporative effect from the isotopes. Um, and you could see that there is some of those, which we left in as we developed. We also looked at the local meteoric water line for Salt Lake City as our reference line for the Snake River Basin. And if we took all of the watersheds north of King Hill, which is sort of in the center of the snake and where we have our time series, one of the things that we did is we came up with a weighted value of all the precipitation coming into there. So we could use that as a comparison and that's represented by this green dot. And you'll see that coming up in a couple of other slides as well. But this is the spatial data we use to develop the isoscape. And this is the isoscape that we ended up developing. The important variables here for this one from that long range that I had a few slides back were longitude being the primary, as you can see the color gradient as we move across here, latitude and elevation. So there were three main variables and not explaining as much as we did within the Willamette uh, but 61%, and I think it, this is for hydrogen isotopes and for oxygen, it was like 63 or 4%. Uh, this is King Hill, as I was mentioning, that's where we have our long time series. And so the red outlines the, that basin. And these are the five different watersheds that Lily McGill investigated for her, um, part of her dissertation work. And this work was published in 2020 um, in Journal of Hydrology. And she characterized uh, the elevational gradients of the five different watersheds that she had, the Snoqualmie being one that we're gonna focus in on in the time series later on, highly explained by elevation. The green, very similar, and it's very close to that one. The Skagit is much more scattered and it's a larger basin that extends uh, up into Canada just a little bit. Um, but interesting here in the uh, Wenatchee, we all again see that the elevation of, does, of the watersheds doesn't really explain much. It's another leeward basin. And then the Cowie, it's a, it's a very slight slope here while it explains some of it. This is a glacier uh, dominated one. And we were thinking that potentially when they were sampling, they weren't the water that was in the smaller watersheds was still actually coming from glaciers at a distant point. So it kind of complicated things as well. But the point being is that each basin was quite unique in the way that it was. So you can't assume that an elevational gradient that you develop in one basin is going to apply to another basin, that each basin has its specific. Um, another interesting thing that Lily did in this particular one is she used um, spatial stream network modeling, which looks at that continuity of connection of, of watersheds and, and up and down streams to be able to try and look at and develop these isoscapes. So I encourage you to take a look at that paper if you're interested in that type of modeling. Um, I wanted to, again, point out the Snoqualmie is the one that we have the time series with, so we're going to talk about that one in more detail later. And then our last basin that we did uh, for the watershed is one of these odd leeward facing basins. And this is the Mary's River. Um, and in this case, we found that really geology was the most important. And when we looked at and separated sites that the, the small little sites that we did cross the basin into those that were dominated by sandstone versus those that were dominated by basalt, we found a real difference. So this is again a dual isotope plot here. The basalt in the blue, you can see here, have more depleted values than those in the sandstone. And that'll become apparent in just a second. But then if you look at precipitation inputs, here's the long-term Corvallis. This was the Corvallis inputs from the year that we were measuring uh, the, all of these different watersheds. 
This is from the LC, which is a, a little bit closer to the coast from Corvallis. And then here's from the coast all the way over in Newport. So we can see that rain out is coming from the coast to the LC to the Corvallis. And um, the LC is just outside the Mary's River Basin. So this is really quite interesting to see that we're getting most of our values that seem to be falling outside uh, as far as their isotopic signature compared to the precipitation. Again, here, if you look at over time, what we measured, um, the basins that were in basalt, again in blue, and the sandstone, you can see that even when we look at the elevation range within the Mary's River here, this is precipitation collected in the Mary's River, we're getting from the sandstone values that fall outside precipitation that we've been collecting in the basin. So what we ended up looking at is that geology. This is maps of the Mary's River Basin. Here's Oregon again, where the Mary's is. And then this is the coast. This is Newport where we're getting the precipitation. Um, these are the locations that we ended up measuring. But here, I wanted to draw your attention to the geology. The sandstone is both inside and outside and extending further to the coast. So that sandstone feature crosses over the divide of the watershed itself compared to the basalt. So what we assumed was happening is that precipitation that was falling uh, in the coast range on the other side outside of the Mary's River was being subsidized through the sandstone into the Mary's River Basin and sustaining that during, uh, you know, in these smaller sandstone dominated watersheds. And we're going to come back and look at the time series of this particular watershed as well. Let's see how we're doing. Um, so basically, we had most of our things that were driven by watershed variability uh, coming from the elevational gradient and the rain out process. Longitude was also a factor, largely because of that rainout factor, as we saw within the snake, also within the Wenatchee, that ended up being important. And then geology also being very important. And the take home message I really wanted to make is that really you do need to develop an isoscape for each watershed that you might be working in, as each basin was quite unique. So now we're gonna come into the applications and try and address what happens when we have climate variability. We continued to look at those small watersheds across uh, the, particularly in the Willamette. So you can see all the years and the different colors that we've gone out and done. And we did just during the summer low flow because September is a beautiful time to be driving around in Corvallis around the, uh, the Willamette Basin itself. And, um, but it also tended to have slightly more depleted. This line is not a regression line from, from these data. That is the line that we originally developed that I showed several slides back um, where we were collecting quarterly. So this is only collected once a year. And you can see that the variation that we've had between years is very small relative to this elevational gradient that we had. So the elevational gradient is maintained. That's important so that the variability that we're seeing in the river is not coming from temporal variability of the input precipitation, but we're making the claim that it comes from the temporal variation of where the water's coming from within the watershed. So the sources are not changing across the watershed itself. Instead, uh, sorry, the value within a small watershed is not changing over time, but when we see the river changing, it's coming from where in the watershed that that's coming from. Now here's our, we have a, a decade's worth of collection, although I don't have all of 2021 yet, so I'm not going to really include this one, but I do have some of the snow data from that. Um, this is snow tail data, so coming from that cascade. The blue line is the so, um, snow water equivalent measured on April 1st, which is recognized as the peak of our snowpack. Um, and then the annual for uh, water year, so measured in September, 
is in green, also coming from the snow tail. So this is looking just at the high elevation sites. And you can see that we've had some years with high inputs. Most of the variation has happened in the snowpack itself and not in the precipitation. Although we have had a series of dry years and I think that that has really influenced things as well. Um, but we've had high and low years. I've written them down at the bottom and I will continue to share those uh, across the bottom to remind you of which were high and low years. This is our temporal data that we have of water isotopes. This is the hydrogen isotope. And then if you use that equation that we developed for elevation, translating the isotope value into an elevation that it comes from, that's shown here. And what I wanna point out are a couple of things. One, we have um, a real distinct pattern that you see on an annual basis with our lowest isotope values, which translate to high elevation, happening in the late summertime. So September, uh, you know, August, September period. And you can see that repeatedly. And then second, you can see that this variation is quite different depending upon the year. And particularly in these low years, this is the 2015 with our lowest snowpack, we had the, one of the lowest elevations that we've measured uh, across time. And then comes back with the high pack. So I just wanted to point those out. Um, as well, we've got two different locations, Corvallis and Portland, that we've been measuring the basin. If you take the highest elevation that we get to in a year, which always happens in the low flow period, and plot that against the percent of, uh, or the median snow water equivalent, so 100% being the normal year, anything above and below that, um, on that April 1st date, you have a pretty good relationship that happens between these periods. So with low elevation happening with low snowpack and much higher elevation with high snowpack. However, there's quite a bit of variability in here um, for those right around that median. And what depends on is preceding years as well as whether or not it was a wet year, not snow, but just overall precipitation versus a dry year that we had. So we've got quite a bit of variability in there. And this is a data set I haven't worked up and published yet. And so I've got a lot of interesting ideas of things that I'd like to go. Uh, if you have ideas about ways of going forward, that would be really great. But here's a quick analysis that I did do, um, which was similar to what I did when I published the first type of paper. We do have that isotopic variability um, if you separate the zones of the Willamette up into the valley bottom and get an isotope value for all the input of the valley bottom, uh, and then the mid-ranged uh, mountains, the low mountains, and then the snow zone above 1,200 meters, uh, you get different isotope values. And we can use a mixing model approach to kind of figure out how much is coming from this and how much coming from the different zones within here. Oops, let's flash through that real quick. Um, and so I did that both in Portland and looking at both average flow and then for Carvallis, the average flow across a year. These are the three colors that translate to those different elevations. And then also focused in on the summer low flow. And the main thing I really want you to see here, besides the fact that it varies a lot, is that the variation in flow at these different times is largely driven by the variation of input from that high elevation snowpack. That high elevation area, flip back, that's like less than 10% of the land mass that we have within the basin. And yet it accounts for the majority of flow, particularly if you're looking at the low flow periods um, and that in Corvallis uh, in particular, we're highly, highly susceptible to variation in that snowpack. And so in those low years, one of the things you might notice is that actually to make up for a little bit of difference in the flow, sometimes those mid elevations, we have got a little bit more coming into them than you might expect. And I think this is coming from uh, management of the large reservoirs that we have that have been sustaining flow within these rivers. So we are highly dependent 
on that snow pack for our river flow, um, both on an annual basis and a summer low flow. Okay, that's just kind of summarizing what I've just been saying across about the Willamette. But it, you know, the main thing is to think about the future and what's gonna happen as that snowpack goes. We are thinking that we're seeing something of a memory effect here. And I think, you know, even though we've got a decade's worth of data, it's gonna take more for us to figure that out to get the combination of a couple of high years followed by low years, a couple of low years followed by a high year to be able to try and really parse out what's happening within this basin. But there's a lot we can do. And so this is one of the next publications I'm gonna be focusing on. And I'd love to hear ideas that you have. Now jumping to a recent publication, this is Lily McGill's work, again, um, just published in uh, Hydrologic Processes. Uh, this is the Snoqualmie measure, uh, River measured over um, a year and a half. And with flow here, precipitation up on the top, and then the isotopic values here. And you can see that this one looks quite different than the pattern that we saw in the Willamette. So both of these are Cascade Mountain major drainages um, and that are getting most of their water coming from the Cascades. And in this case though, you're seeing a couple of uh, vents with precipitation that has a particularly low flow causing a value. And then you're also seeing the summer snow melt. So this is in May, June, that they get the most depleted value. That is not what we saw in the Willamette at all. Um, and instead, during the summertime, where in the Willamette, we saw the values continuing down when with Slovo got low, in the Snoqualmie, when the flow is at its lowest, the values are going up, which means that the water is coming from low elevation that's sustaining that base flow through the summertime period. Very, very different. And so we figured that this was a different type of groundwater source that's supplying that compared to what's happening within the Willamette itself. And if you look at the geology of this basin, that helps sustain it. Whereas in the Cascades, and I, I uh, sorry, in the Willamette, the Cascade Mountains down that further south have a highly fractured porous bedrock of uh, uh, volcanic bedrock at the very, very highest elevation. That type of feature is not found just further north in the Snoqualmie. Instead, you've got mostly bedrock that is not very fractured, um, a high basalt uh, bedrock. And the low elevation is deep glacial till, which is also, this area was glaciated, whereas the Willamette was not glaciated. And so that makes a big difference, even though they're both Pacific Northwest uh, watersheds. And so we're thinking that the source of the summer low flow is coming from this low elevation, deep glacial till, and this high uh, mountains are just flashing off and giving us that summer peak that we see in, um, in the flow to go back here, where you can see the snow melt signature happens all very, very quickly and rushes off. So one is that the, this, the Snoqualmie River is gonna be much more resilient to changes in the snowpack, particularly for the low flow period of time. Okay, moving on to the Snake River now. Uh, this, we have a six year time series, and this is work again by Grace Windler, who just finished her PhD uh, at the University of Arizona. And, Here's our time series. And then here is the same time series plotted in dual isotope space. One thing that you'll notice is that the Snake River is a, is a much drier, drier system than either the Snoqualmie or the Willamette where we didn't see a lot of evaporation. All of these points are falling off the global meteoric waterline. So we really had to deal with the fact that evaporation is influencing these river systems. And how do we try to deal with that to interpret source water? So we used a tool that uh, Gabe Bowen at the University of Utah had developed called the ISWE tool. And this is all available online and they published in 2018. Um, I was a co-author on that paper, although I have to say 
Gabe did the majority of this of this work that's available. And so these are our tools and our packages that he's got available. And it's a Bayesian approach to address the uncertainty associated with taking points that fall, say, here off the global meteoric waterline using evaporation lines calculated through climate and extrapolating back to the global meteoric waterline or to what a potential sources can be. He has a multiple approaches there um, and calculating the uncertainty around that. So in these cases, taking and moving the points and trying to infer what the sources were, but also looking at the extent of evaporation. So having two of those portions, uh, uh, points of information that we had. So we have now we've separated those out. We have both of those. And so the, I, this is a busy graph or, paper or slide. Um, but here in this top one, we've got the source. So again, that separated point here, the source component. And on the bottom, this difference between them, that's the evaporative component. And this is the dual isotope plot with the original values in solid fills, um, and then the ice we interpreted values back to their sources. And again, remember we developed the uh, our isoscape with the evaporated signature coming off those watersheds. So I, I can go into more detail on that if you like uh, at, a, at later after the talk. But the Green is that precipitation weighted value for the King Hill time series that we had. So I wanted to point that out. And it's also the green dashed line that's up here. And the first thing you're going to notice is that not all of the watersheds were contributing relative to the same proportion of their precipitation inputs. Um, that would be if they were on that green line. And they're falling well below that line. So what we're seeing is that the more eastern portions of the watershed that have the more depleted water isotopes are contributing more water relative to the rest of the watershed that's focusing at King Hill, which is located right about here into the center. The second thing I want you to notice on this is that we've got the blue line is the, is the flow coming within the snake. And the, for the first four years or three and a half years that we measured, there was very low flow in the snake, then followed by a series of three years with higher than average flow from larger snowpacks that were happening. And we saw quite a bit of difference that happened when you got into the high flows. That's the only time that it started to approach this green line and that uh, where all the watersheds were contributing relative to their precipitation inputs. Um, the rest of the time, it was below that. And if you look here, if we separated out the flows, the red points are those in the high flow where it was above median flow, and the blue points are below the median flow. And so you can see that pattern really clearly. The second point I wanted to make here is that by separating these out, we were able now to be able to see this clear evaporation signal that was happening in the summertime within the river itself and actually quantify that and when it was occurring. So you can see that evaporation and then you can see the delayed point of happening evaporation after that big snow melt that was happening within the, causing the high flows. So there's a real power in being able to use this type of tool to separate it out and get information that might otherwise be obscured by, by having the evaporation on those. Okay, so on to our last basin now, this is the Mary's River. And what I wanted to point out in the time series here, here's flow, and this is the separation, how much is coming from the sandstone uh, in green and the basalt in the blue. And you can see that for the Mary's River, the majority of flow throughout the year is coming from those sandstone features. And to some points during the summer low flow, it's almost all of that flow. And a good portion of the flow that's coming from the sandstone is coming from outside of that watershed. So the Mary's River watershed is delineated on the surface is not an accurate watershed for the amount of water and where it's originating within that, uh, within um, the Mary's River itself. 
And so again, just to reiterate, there was a huge amount of water coming from the windward side of the coast range, transferring over to the leeward side and sustaining the Mary's River flow throughout the year. Okay, so that's a whirlwind tour of, of some of the basins within the Pacific Northwest. But I hope you got an idea that, you know, even though you might have a basin in the Pacific Northwest and think that they're fairly similar, when they, you look at, say, the Snoqualmie versus the Willamette, they're functioning very, very different. Geology really does matter. Um, you also have to be able to develop a basin specific. So if anyone is, wants to try and look at larger rivers and understand the spatial sources of where the water is coming from at different times, you need to create one. You cannot just assume that the elevational gradient in one location can be applied to another. We also found that uh, two of our watersheds, the Snake and the Willamette, are highly vulnerable to snowpack and changes in the snowpack and the influence on the flow within the river itself. Whereas two of them, the Snoqualmie and the Marys, seem to be much more resilient uh, to changes in the snowpack themselves. And so these types of geological features and differences are going to make a difference in what's happening in global security and, and the security of these particular basins across the world. Okay, and with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. I don't even know if I can see the chat. Yeah, I can I can monitor the chat um, for you okay. don't have to worry about it, but Great. thanks so much. That was a really a terrific tour of Pacific North Northwest hydrology. I'd like to open it up to questions, either uh, ideally show us your Un, un, unmute and, and uh, show your video or type into the chat, either one. And perhaps just while we await uh, the first question, I guess one thing, listening to your talk, Renee, it seems like the, the residence time of water in these, in these uh, rocks or weathered portions of rocks and the transit time of water through the catchment and into the stream could really explain a lot. And I, I'm, I'm just, I guess I'm wondering your thoughts on that. So, you know, some estimates of mean transit times in the Western Cascades have been, you know, one to three years. In the coast range, it's more three to 11 years or 15 years. I'm, I'm just wondering if that enters into your thoughts in terms of some things you're seeing, or maybe even some surprises that you're not seeing greater lags because of that transit time. Any any thoughts on that? Yeah, I I, I have. First off, that uh, residence time helps to buffer out all the variability of the incoming precipitation that we have. So that is a tool that we rely on to be able to develop these isoscapes and use the surface water as the integrator to get rid of that temporal variance in the precipitation. You know, so that's that's one thing that makes it very nice, uh, you know. But the second was also thinking about um, the Mary's River itself and, you know, the, the buffering that it has as, as far as the residence time within there. I'm not really sure, you know, we still see changes in the flow, right? The, the flow is, is highly responsive, although the water may be old. There's still that idea, um, you know, the water isotopes, what they can, if they vary up to about four years and after you get beyond four years of age, um, any annual or type of variation seems to disappear from water isotopes and you have to move into tritium type isotopes, I think they'd be able to really get at age of, of water. Um, but I, I do think it's really important, you know, and how that's gonna impact as far as sustaining flow um, and groundwater, well, you know, but it's also going to depend on groundwater mining and how much tapping of things that, that people are doing. So the till that's supplying the water for the Snoqualmie, which provides water for the city of Seattle, um, you know, what's the variability in the residence time of that one? I don't, I don't think anyone's looked at that at all, well, but realizing its importance is, is really good. Important. Thank you. Okay, I see a question in the chat from Cody Miller. 
how is it that lithology of the basin causes the effects you saw in the isotope results? Elevation changes make sense to me, but I'd not heard of lithology related effects. So the lithology doesn't cause changes in the isotopes, but the lithology is what's creating changes in the source water, right, over time. So uh, for example, in the high Cascades, we've got a very porous volcanic um, upper high cascade feature. And so a lot of the water goes in and stays there. So this comes back to Jeff's residence time um, and it's coming out in springs. So I would say that much of the flow within the Willamette is sustained by these high cascade springs that is snow melt percolating in, penetrating out and coming out. Whereas the mid elevation has a much tighter bedrock so there's no storage there and it's moving directly out. So the, the low Cascade Mountains are not storing. And that's the same with the upper um, area in the Snoqualmie that we also have this very tight bedrock. So there's very low residence time and that water is just running right off. And so the sustained flow in the Snoqualmie is coming from a deeper stored water source that's so providing the water during the summertime and for, but in the Cascades, that's coming from that high volcanic. And so the signature is coming from an elevation in the rain out process for the isotopes, um, but the geology is controlling what's flowing into the river when. Does that make sense? Yes, yes. Yeah, the um, isotopes are just a tool to see what the geology is doing. Right. I'll go to another question in the chat and then look for hands up who might want to uh, ask a question. Um, this is from Toby. Okay, there is correlation between elevation and temperature, et cetera. How does this influence the isoscape pattern? Yeah, so how much is rain out? How much is temperature? Um, I think they just work together to accelerate the the elevational grade that we end up seeing, but whether or not individual storms might have different rainout gradients themselves. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, well, I think it's, I think rainout personally is a more dominant feature than necessarily the temperature, because what happens with the temperature is you're moving up, it gets colder, but the difference between the vapor and the precip gets larger, which kind of actually goes in the other direction. So you're, yeah, so it's not, it, it, you know, but anyway, they both play a role. Mm -hmm. Looking for hands up or other questions, just uh, unmute and chime in. Renee, uh, one, one question always is, uh, you know, why, why is it so important to know this isotope stuff in a watershed? You know, what do you get from inclusion of a view of stable isotopes that you don't get from the hydrometrics? So think back to uh, Christina Tagg and Gordon Grant's 2004 paper in WRR. They looked at uh, low flow in the Willamette and found that, yeah, I think their, their expression was geology was destiny for low flow because high cascades volcanics based on the hydrometrics uh, were dominating the, the flow. But can you, can you give a, an idea of why isotopes are, <clears throat> are, are so insightful or, or help you go beyond the, the hydrometrics for water security I, issues or, yeah. I, I think the two, work very, very well together. They're complementary information. And yes, you can, if you have hydrometric data, get at some of it if they're in the different locations. But the isotope signatures themselves, I think are a little bit more finer scale for going up in elevation to really being able to try and tease apart some of these things. Um, and again, I, you know, I don't 
know, like in the Snoqualmie, that was very surprising to me to mm -hmm. see that increase in water isotopes happening during the summertime and that it was low flow. And there wasn't a single person that worked in King County, which is the county that it comes from, and the water managers within there that thought that the, the low elevation gravels were a major source of flow during that time period. But yeah. after showing the isotope data, they started thinking about that. And so you have, I mean, maybe they don't have, you know, um, dams and gauges in the right places at the right time to be able to try and pick that up. Um, so the isotopes really revealed something different about the way that that watershed was functioning and has really changed the way that the water managers in the Snoqualmie are thinking about that. And, and also in their restoration attempts of like, okay, mm -hmm. if we have to recharge, you know, the, um, the base flow, where do we put our restoration efforts? Um, and so I think, I think it's really made a difference in that sense that isotopes, yeah. isotope, they're complementary. We need them both though, I definitely yeah. are. Other comments, questions in the chat or on mute? I think uh, one last question maybe, um, the sandstone that you mentioned in the, I guess the Mary's River watershed, um, how do you know it's coming from outside the basin? And does that square with say a water balance estimate that says, oh, we got more water in the stream than we should have based on the watershed area? Do you have a... Yeah, I think, you know, um, Catalina and I have talked about this and going back and doing that very thing and we haven't done it yet. You know? yeah. um, so, but the reason that we know that is that we have um, precipitation isotopes coming from Newport, which is right at the coast where the water rain is coming in. The Alce, which is just at the peak of the mountain range, the coastal mountain range, so just outside of the Mary's River, and then we have precipitation inside the Mary's River. And when you look at the sandstone values, they're falling between Newport and Alsea. And they don't fall within precipitation range that we see inside the Mary's yeah. River basin itself. So we don't have precipitation data that matches the river. Yeah. And so if there's only one way to get that, it's a zero sum game. It's got to be components. And it, believe me, it. it drove me crazy. I had no idea this was a puzzle when I did the first paper. I was like, okay, how can the river be different from the sum of its parts? Yeah. Well, and it, again, we're not parts. yeah. And again, a unique contribution from the stable isotopes telling you you've got foreign water in there. Right. Uh, and and so, in this case, there's one gauge on yeah. that. So you couldn't use any hydrometric, you know, to be able to tell that. Right. Um, you know, but yes, we do need to do uh, mass balance to try and figure out whether or not, you know, how, how the gauge versus input precipitation gauges, you know, um, and, and what that says uh, as far as the flows are concerned. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess flow sources, residence times, you know, the geographic source contributions, that's, that is a unique thing that the stable isotopes can provide. So we're just coming up to the top of the hour and I think we'll, we'll um, end this formal seminar and say thank you very much Renee for a really stimulating talk. And for those early career folks that would like to stay on, we'll take a two minute break. Don't go anywhere Renee, but we'll give you two minutes to maybe recharge your coffee cup and then we'll come back for uh, some minutes of uh, early career discussions if you're willing. So. On, on Absolutely. Behalf of, on behalf of everyone on the call, thanks so much for your uh, your talk today, and we'll see those early career folks um, back here in a couple of minutes for discussions with Renee. Thanks again, Renee. All right, great. Thank you.